Well, could you talk a little bit about just the, you know, the firm's strategy and being a specialist and what that does for you? Sure. Uh, well, first, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me, Dean Joss. And Dean Joss actually came to speak uh, at, uh, at our firm where we hosted 20, 30 venture capitalists about a year and a half ago. And it was what he's doing to make, remake the school I thought was quite interesting, actually, and something I hadn't thought about. In fact, when I was at school, um, I didn't go to school that much. Uh, we can talk more about uh, <laughs> lessons learned from uh, uh, business school. But uh, I think what you're doing here is fantastic. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, specialist firms. So we believe in specialization. You know, I believe it so much that I voted with my own career. Uh, my own background is both my parents that were electrical engineering professors, and I was an engineer by training like Tim, and wanted to always do technology. And, you know, if you look at every other part of society, it's become specialized. I have three little kids, and they have different tennis teachers and different ballet teachers and basketball coaches and soccer coaches. And so why should it be any different? You don't go to your heart surgeon for brain problems. And so we just think long term, with specialization comes differential rewards. And I was at a great firm called TPG. And I, you know, long term, we thought um, that we just had a cognitive dissonance, which is the same people who are investing in Continental Airlines and Behringer Wines and Ducati motorcycles couldn't day-to-day -day keep up with what's happening with semiconductors and communications and software. And long terms, if we specialize in those things, we would have differential returns. And that's why we voted with our careers. So at Francisco, you guys have led some very successful technology, uh, particularly divisional buyouts, some growth equity investments, some recaps, some restructuring. Uh, it's been a very busy time over the last six, eight years. Um, Where's the IT sector right now? Where do you see it going over the next couple of years? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a good question to ask. And we just had our investor conference last week, so it's kind of top of mind for me. But you know, we're sitting in the hub of Silicon Valley. I mean, the great thing about the technology industry is it's, you know, if you read Joseph Schumpeter's Creative Destruction, it's the one industry that's really characterized by creative destruction. So new technologies are created every day. The venture capitalists are doing that. You know, who would have thought about the we? A couple of years ago, and you know, like now, you go to any party, and that's kind of the centerpiece of parties. Uh, who would have thought about the iPod? Who would have thought about flat panel displays everywhere? And so, you have all sorts of new applications that are driving technology that people didn't even conceive five years ago. I'd say there's probably three big tailwinds for technology and a couple headwinds. The three big tailwinds is if you look at the history of tech, it was all driven by cycles. So it was a mainframe wave, there was a PC wave, there was a cell phone wave, there's an internet wave. Today, there's no single killer application driving technology. That's the good news and bad news. You know, it, it, the bad news is there's no huge growth for tech. But the good news, it's a confluence of different applications. There's literally five different sectors that are 10% plus sectors. And we think that will continue to outpace technology. Technology is growing, growing at two times the rate of GDP. And we think it will for the next decade. So that's one big tailwind. The second big t uh, uh, tailwind for technology is, frankly, emerging markets. And a lot of the things we take for granted today just don't exist in India and China and other parts of the world. And that's a huge market in terms of new applications. And the third big area of technology is that there's new technology that people just haven't thought of. And you know, the best uh, example for me is I came from a middle class background. And my parents are, you know, and a lot of people, if I see some Indian people in the crowd, but they're, they were frankly cheap. And uh, <laughs> so we didn't. You know, we didn't really spend any money, but the other day, my mother tells me she's got a navigation system in her car. And I was just kind of stunned that she would actually put in a navigation system. <laughs> she, of course, didn't. She bought a $100 little device. But if my mother's buying a $100 navigation device, that's going to India. That's going to China. And so those are things we didn't think of. And, and so I think that's, that's the big, big, all those are big positives for tech. The two big negatives for tech is it's a $600 billion marketplace today. When you get to $600 billion, the law of large numbers starts compounding against you, and you just can't grow as fast. And so we don't think tech is going to grow 15 20%. We think it's going to grow high single digits. By the way, that's good for the buyout industry. But it does have impacts on how people run businesses. And the second thing, and you kind of ask near term, is you know, next 18 to 24 months, tech is not immune to the economy. You know, a lot of the end markets for technology are financial services, obviously, where you, you know, used to run a bank, obviously, and you know, that's 20% of tech spending. Um, you know, CEOs, CFOs are impacted by their stock prices. They cut spending. And so there may be some near-term chop, choppiness in the tech economy, but we think long-term it's pretty bullish. I think I'm correct that your firm has a strategic relationship with Sequoia. Yeah. 
Uh, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that relationship, how it advantages Francisco in, in today's environment? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the relationship with Sequoia is something we started in 99 when we started the firm. It actually even goes back to when I was at TPG. When we were investing in new uh, uh, deals, we were actually partnering with venture capitalists. And the reason we were partnering with venture capitalists is the one thing you can't get wrong in doing tech private equity. So tech private equity is different than all other private equity in one way, which is tech is characterized by platform obsolescence. So new technologies dislocate existing technologies. And you just need to make sure you're not on the wrong side of Clayton Christensen's curve, as it were, right? <laughs> and who better to understand that than the venture capital? So when we were at TPG, we, we did it on an ad hoc basis with VCs where we partnered with five different VCs on five different deals. When we started Francisco, we said we want to do it in a systematic way with one venture capitalist. And, you know, if you're going to do it with one, why not start at the top? I mean, the, uh, you know, the little tagline, Sequoia guys like using his companies they've started are 15% of the NASDAQ, which is kind of a staggering statistic, but it's Google and Cisco and Yahoo and what have you. But There's 15%, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> You know, what we get from them basically is two things. One is on the diligence end. We ping them every time for, dil uh, for the network. And frankly, it's not the Sequoia partners themselves that are that useful. I mean, they're obviously smart uh, folks, but they'll put us in touch with the CEO. He'll put us in touch with the VP of sales or marketing. And it's a very leveraged way for us to do diligence. And, you know, historically, we used to use consultants, and consultants can be useful. When you're doing something this special, it helps. And the second thing it helps is once you own a portfolio company, they can help you open doors. Now, ultimately, tech companies have to sell because they have something differentiated, but opening doors can be helpful, and that's where Sequoia comes in handy. So I think over the last nine years at uh, Francisco, you've done about $4 billion of equity investing. Um, could you share some of the highlights about deals that went really well and maybe some that haven't gone so well in terms of what are the lessons learned uh, on sure. both, both sides? Um, you know, on the, I'll give you a one case study of a deal that went well and one case study of a deal that didn't go so well. So we bought a, um, we bought a company called AMI Semiconductor in, uh, from Japan Energy in 2000. And the reason it was successful is we did some transformative things up front. Um, so what AMI does is what's called mixed signal ASICs. Mixed signal means analog and digital, and ASIC means application-specific integrated circuit, which means you make one chip for one customer. And it, AMI was actually a company that was started in Pocatello, Idaho, which I'd never heard of until we bought the company. It's three hours outside <laughs> of Boise, by the way. Um, and these guys had been around forever. It was kind of a company time had forgotten. And it was went public in the 70s, got bought by Gould Electronics, which was a conglomerate in Cleveland in the 80s, and then got, subsequently got bought by Japan Energy. Stayed as an orphan division within Japan Energy. In late 99, Japan Energy ran into a liquidity crisis and decided to sell AMI to us. And But the... It, the business that the management selling was selling was 180 degrees opposite of what we were buying. So what management selling was three things. One, it was, you know, ASICs were dead, but they were going to transform to standard products, which they thought were the wave of the future. That was number one. Number two was they thought wireless was sexy, and so they were going to spend all their money on wireless. And then number three is they were going to build a state-of-the-art fab in Pocatello, and they were going to, they're spending $100 million a year in CapEx. And I remember being at the first meeting with the VP of marketing. I said, you know, why are you trying to be in wireless? And he said, well, because it's sexy and we get high multiples. And I said, but what do you know about wireless? And he said, well, not much, but, you know, it's got high multiples. And I said, I'm a really, you know, I really love basketball, but, you know, I'm five foot ten and can't jump more than 20 <laughs> inches. So I decided that may not be what I want to spend time on. So, I mean, we basically did four things. From, number one is we replaced the CEO uh, uh, and the entire management team. Uh, the, the second thing we did was we said, you know, this wireless strategy makes no sense. In fact, the CEO had set up a headquartered in San Diego because he didn't really want to commute to Pocatello. So we shut down San Diego. Uh, third thing is, you know, the company was doing $400 million of revenue and spending $100 million in CapEx, and that just doesn't really work. And we said, why don't we go to a fab light strategy, which had happened in other parts in the semiconductor world, but had not happened in ASICs because you're making a unique customer. But we did a joint venture with TSMC, which is the world's leading foundry, where state-of-the-art manufacturing was done by TSMC and a non-state-of-the-art manufacturing would be done in Pocatello. That's uh, reduced CapEx from $100 million a year to $25 million a year. And the fourth thing is actually we discovered that mixed signal ASICs was not a dying product line. It was true that ASICs were being dislocated in the digital world by something called field programmable gate arrays, but in the mixed signal world, it wasn't being dislocated. And in fact, we renamed AMI. AMI used to stand for 
American Microsystems. We renamed AMIs to stand for Automotive, Medical, and Industrial, which are the areas where mixed signal ASICs had a home. Changed all that around. Um, you know, we did a recap, we did an IPO, and ultimately it wouldn't be a very big investment. But, you know, I think it was because we made some pretty tough decisions early that changed the trajectory of that investment. So that's the good news. Now, the bad news. Um, so we bought another semiconductor company in 2000 uh, that didn't go so well. And we bought a company called uh, Legerity out of AMD. At the time, I knew something was going to be wrong because uh, we went to the Sequoia guys and one of the senior partners at Sequoia told me, run, don't walk. <laughs> and, you know, when we were having the investment decision made, a couple of my partners were like, oh, this is a no-brainer. And I knew that was the kiss of death yeah. because, and it was. We, and yeah. by the way, we've had one other investment like that where my partners are, this is a no-brainer. I'm, I'm very worried about what's going to happen to that company. Um, but the reason that, so this was a communications chip company in 2000. If you recall, NASDAQ was at 5,000. <laughs> communications chip companies were trading at 15 to 20 times revenue. And we bought at one and a half times revenue, six and a half times EBITDA. So we were feeling pretty good. So what went wrong? Number one is the revenue and EBITDA we bought was not real. So Legerity <laughs> sold what's called slicks and slacks. It wasn't it was fraud. But what these guys did was terminate every phone line in the world. But they were selling to, you know, Lucent and uh, Siemens and Alcatel who were selling to the Arbox. And when we called Lucent and Siemens and Alcatel, they said, yeah, yeah, we're buying all this stuff. But they didn't realize their customers were sitting on tons of inventory. And so the revenue in EBITDA had probably been pulled forward two years because of what's happened in the supply mm -hmm. chain. So you know, the first lesson learned is don't always trust the customer calls and try to do second and third level supply chain analysis. The second thing we got wrong is we had the thesis half the world hadn't made a phone call. So U.S. and Europe, it was a saturated market. And it wasn't going to grow much, but India, China, Latin America hadn't made a phone call. And we thought the ASP, or average selling price, of the chips in those war countries would be 30% of the, what happened in the U.S. The problem is if you're in China or India and you've never made a phone call, you don't really care about lifeline quality. You don't really care if Huawei rips off the IP. You know, you, and so the ASP of what happened in China and India was like $0.06 cents versus $0.30. Cents. So the unit growth happened, but the yeah, revenue growth revenue never there. happened. Yeah. And the third thing, with part of our investment thesis was we thought voice over cable would take off. And, you know, we were right, but we were like four years early. And when the communications maelstrom hit, basically everyone stopped spending. And so Legerity actually grew again, but it happened four years after we thought. And we lost most of our money because we frankly just invested at the wrong time. So tech private equity, uh, how do you source deals? Uh, where, where do you find the next AMI? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the way we're organized is every partner, it, I think it's kind of the way Tim was describing Madison Deer War in terms of in practice areas. But we're a specialist firm, but within tech we have vertical areas. So one partner's in charge of semiconductors, one partner's in charge of, you know, communication software, et cetera, et cetera. And we basically have everyone set up a business plan that they try to review with the partnership once a year. And there's basically five ways of sourcing. Uh, one is conglomerates. So, you know, you're supposed to be calling on IBM, HP, Motorola, Philips, Siemens um, every four times a year. And uh, so people are responsible for that. The second thing is to call on the tech CEOs and CFOs that are in your sector. Uh, in my, in, that's in semis in my case. The third thing is um, what we call the network. And the network is Sequoia. We have 100 tech execs who are investors in our fund. And kind of, the, you know, we have about 20 operating advisors who are investors, so we're pinging them all the time. Fourth is banks, like to make sure you, you know, stay friendly with all the sector guys who are covering your sector again. And then lastly, we run screens every week, okay, and just on what comes up. And then the last thing beyond that is everyone's responsible for developing themes in their sector. So, you know, in semis, it could be we think back end is at a dislocation uh, for these reasons. We should go after all the back end companies and you go visit all those companies. So, you know, I. I We've done the math. It's probably about 20% in each of those areas in terms of where sourcing comes from. Obviously, mm -hmm. we've benefited somewhat because of the, uh, with all these mega funds being raised, a lot of our historical competition has kind of moved up and out of our kind of middle market focus. So, you know, we've done 15 deals in FP2, which is our second fund, um, and 12 of them had no financial buyer competition. I think that's we're lucky in that way. There have been some new funds that have been raised that I think will be competitors, but you just got to out-hustle people. You know, it's Tom Barrick said it. You know, there's non-information advantages. It's, uh, I guess it's what Edison said. Genius is 99% perspiration, perspiration and 1% inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. 
So since graduating from the GSB, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, <laughs> it's 13 years, 12 years, sorry. What, what, have been, um, what have been the professional challenges for you? What do you think has been the most difficult thing? So probably the biggest professional challenge for me is uh, about two and a half years ago, I took over kind of running Francisco day to day and I inherited it from the guy I was working for and frankly, the guy who had hired me into the private equity industry and had taken me over to start Francisco. And, um, you know, that was uh, basically as I took over running FP, we, we had to redo economics for every partner and a lot of every one of those guys is my friends and I had to reduce economics for, you know, seven of my partners, and that was not a fun thing to do, frankly. Um, and it's uh, probably that's been the, you know, I, I believe private equity and software are the two industries where one great investor or one great deal can make a fund. And so, you know, you want to create a culture where it's not a tenure system. You want to create a culture where young people can come from, flourish from below. You know, we, we're hiring two GSB classmates, uh, two of your GSB classmates next year, Matt Spessler and Chris Adams. and. This is what I try to sell them on, which is, you know, we want to create a culture that young people can do extraordinary things. They're going to get extraordinarily remunerated. They're going to get great opportunities. But the flip side of that is that means you've got to create room at the top. And um, that was a difficult process. You know, we went through it very well. Uh, I think we have a much better team for it, but it wasn't something that actually my touchy-feely training helped. Um, and I did take that class. Uh, uh, so that was probably the hardest thing. So what's success mean to you? Uh, you know, I have three daughters that are eight, six, and three. Um, success to me is when they say my favorite person in the world is I love my dad. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm a workaholic. I work all the time. I love my job. But uh, when you go home and with your wife and three kids and uh, I come from a close-knit family, to me that's actually all that's success. All, and all this is re less relevant. Uh, Having said that, I want to be very successful in my business career, but at the high level, I try not to lose sight of the f uh, fact that your family comes first. So what advice would you give students? Uh, same question I asked him, I guess, when you were here. You know, what do you maybe wish you'd done more of, less of? Uh, uh, maybe someone gave you advice that was really valuable, or someone gave you advice you wish you'd heeded and you didn't take. I don't know, but, but in that whole realm of reflection. Yeah, someone, you know, did give me advice right when I was kind of entering business school. I was, um, it was a guy named Lawrence Levy who used to be uh, uh, the youngest partner of Wilson Sonsini and then he became an a executive of various firms and he, I was on a plane ride with him and he said, you know, don't try to figure out your life three, five, seven years ahead because you'll never know what's going to happen. Just be very, very good at whatever you're doing and opportunities will avail themselves to you. And then when those opportunities avail themselves to you, try to take it. And I'd say that's the biggest advice I can give folks that, uh, which is people are super prepared today. You know, they've sort of got their life plotted out. You know, uh, I'm going to give Matt, Matt grief because we're hiring him back and I love Matt to death, but you know, Matt put me through the more diligence than any LP did before he joined Francisco. Um, you know, he had, we had, I had four MIF meetings with him. He went through every portfolio company, every you know, every long-term vision, I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, but, uh, no, no, but we're delighted to have Matt back. Uh, <laughs> I'm, we're glad he's on our side, but it's like you just can't plot. <laughs> yeah. You just can't plot life that far in advance. So just be very good at whatever you're doing and, and, and opportunities will uh, happen and you got to take advantage of it. And then the, probably the thing I wish I'd done more in business school is, you know, I worked really hard before I came into business school and, um, you know, I was pretty good at math, so I could kind of get away by not studying in most of these classes. And, um, you know, back then we didn't have grades, so it was, it was a huge plus. Um, and, you know, I wish actually I'd spend more time in the classroom here, which is because I think there was a lot to learn. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's, the professors are going to like to hear that or not like to hear it, but. No, um, they love hearing that. Uh, that's great. <laughs> No, I really do because I hung out with a lot of friends. I made a lot of great friends, you know, drank a lot of beer. But, like, but I, was like, I was like, okay, I'm going to come here and take a two-year break because I know I'm going to have to work hard again. And in retrospect, I, there were some amazing students, amazing professors, and a lot of things I wish I, I would go back to school for free. And I, but I didn't take advantage of it when I was here. And so that's probably the biggest thing. Just like your mother said, study hard, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Well, I know the organizers want us to uh, clear the stage here at 5.15 so we can get everybody ready for the next session. But let me say, first of all, join me in thanking DJ and Tim for a wonderful <laughs>